You're listening to The Philosopher's Note on You Can Heal Your Life. More wisdom in less time. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome to The Philosopher's Notes on You Can Heal Your Life, the international bestseller with more than 30 million copies sold by Luis L. Hay. We'll start with a quote from Luis. She says, Good health begins with loving the self. So do prosperity and love and creative self-expressions. End quote. I like Louise Hay, and I'm not alone. Over 30 million people have purchased her classic book, You Can Heal Your Life. And I don't know how many tens of millions of others have been inspired and empowered by the incredible books published by Hay House, the publishing house she founded. An incredible woman. And there's a reason so many peeps have read this book. It rocks. It's focused on the fact that all dis-ease can be traced to us not loving ourselves enough. And it's packed with all kinds of big ideas on how to get our self-love on. The book also has a sweet section that outlines the emotional disturbance or thought patterns tied to all kinds of physical ailments. It's incredibly spot on. Interesting stuff. But you'll have to get the book for all that mojo. For now, let's take a quick peek at a handful of my favorite big ideas. We'll start with approve of yourself exactly as you are. Quote, when people come to me with a problem, I don't care what it is, poor health, lack of money, unfulfilling relationships, or stifled creativity, there is only one thing I ever work on, and that is loving the self. I find that as we really love and accept and approve of ourselves exactly as we are, then everything in life works. It's as if little miracles are everywhere. Our health improves, we attract more money, our relationships become more fulfilling, and we begin to express ourselves in creatively fulfilling ways. All this seems to happen without even trying. End quote. So the book is essentially one big string of ideas on how we can go about loving ourselves and removing the dis-ease that's created when we don't. Step one, as Louise says, we need to, and this is in all caps, approve of ourselves exactly as we are. End quote. So what's one thing that you currently aren't approving of in yourself? We all have at least a handful of things, if we're honest, huh? All right. So you got that one thing? Sweet. Now imagine being totally cool with it, totally approving and totally accepting it. How does that feel? If you're like me, there's a definite release of tension the moment I approved of and accepted that aspect of myself. Really powerful stuff. Try it out. And then once you've done the first one, add another aspect of yourself that you can approve of. And another. And another. And watch the tension dissolve and the miracle of you flow through your life. The next big idea is should to could. Quote, I believe that should is one of the most damaging words in our language. Every time we use should, we are, in effect, saying wrong. Either we are wrong, or we were wrong, or we are going to be wrong. I don't think we need more wrongs in our life. We need to have more freedom of choice. I would like to take the word should and remove it from the vocabulary forever. I'd replace it with the word could. Could gives us a choice, and we are never wrong. End quote. So this is one of the all-time greatest big ideas. Seriously. Should, 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 should. Tony Robbins, you can see the note, says, Quit shooting all over yourself. So uh, are you shooting all over yourself? Well, stop. You're stinking up the place. Seriously, though, try playing a game with yourself. See if you can start to notice every time you use the word should. And then swap it out for could and feel the difference between the two. Should's a downer. Always. Could, as Louise says, offers choice. In that freedom to choose is our power. So Louise offers a really cool exercise in the book goes like this. In the notes, I have a section here where you can write some stuff down, so you might want to press pause and follow along and write it down if you can. Uh, She says, complete five sentences that start with, I should. So number one, I should. Uh, Two, I should. Three, I should. Four, I should. Five, I should. All right, now read each one and ask why. 
Just get that sense. Now take those five sentences and start them with, if I really wanted to, I could. All right? So same exact sentences that you use the I should for. Start it with, if I really wanted to, I could. If you actually do that exercise, you'll feel a huge shift in energy. You're basically shifting from a disempowered critical should to an empowered expansive could. And that's a shift we want to make often. <laughs> All right, the next big idea is mirror, mirror on the wall. Quote, I ask my clients to pick up a small mirror, look into their own eyes, and say their names and I love and accept you exactly as you are. This is so difficult for many people. Seldom do I get a calm reaction, let alone enjoyment from this exercise. Some cry or are close to tears. Some get angry. Some belittle their features or qualities. Some insist they can't do it. End quote. So in the book, Luis talks about the fact that some of our deepest programming came from our parents and other adults who, when we were kids, looked us straight in the eye and told us some stuff that we may not have preferred to have burned into our consciousness. She believes that one of the most powerful ways to recondition our minds is to look with love into our own eyes and repeat, I love and accept you exactly as you are. Try it out. If you're like me, you might feel a little wacky the first few dozen times you do it, but it's really amazing. Now I'm following her advice and having a little bromance with myself every time I look at the mirror. <laughs> I like it. All right, that leads us to the next big idea, which is cleaning our mental house. Quote, if you want to clean a room thoroughly, you will pick up and examine everything in it. Some things you will look at with love, and you will dust them or polish them to give them new beauty. Some things you will see that need refinishing or repair, and you will make a note to do that. Some things will never serve you again, and it becomes time to let those things go. Old magazines and newspapers and dirty paper plates can be dropped into the wastebasket very calmly. There is no need to get angry in order to clean the room. It is the same thing when we are cleaning our mental house. There is no need to get angry just because some of the beliefs in it are ready to be tossed out. Let them go as easily as you would scrape bits of food into the trash after a meal. Would you really dig into yesterday's garbage to make tonight's meal? Do you dig into old mental garbage to create tomorrow's experiences? If a thought or belief does not serve you, let it go. End quote. I love that. Is it time to clean up that room in your head? No need to get all cranky about it as you find thoughts, beliefs, etc. You just don't dig. Just toss them out. And while we're on the subject of dirty minds and making tonight's dinner with last night's garbage, get these wacky stats from Marcy Shimoff's great book, Happy for No Reason. You can see the notes on that. She says, quote, according to scientists, we have 60,000 thoughts a day. That's one thought per second during every waking hour. No wonder we're so tired at the end of the day. And what's even more startling is that of those approximately 60,000 thoughts, 95% are the same thoughts you had yesterday and the day before and the day before that. Your mind is like a record player playing the same record over and over again. Talk about being stuck in a rut. Still, that wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the next statistic. For the average person, 80% of those habitual thoughts are negative. That means that every day most people have more than 45,000 negative thoughts. Dr. Daniel Amen, a world-renowned psychiatrist and brain imaging specialist, calls them automatic negative thoughts, or ants. End quote. So is it time for a mental cleanse? We've already talked about swapping your shoulds for coulds, and that's a really big idea. You might also want to see what you can do about removing all blame, criticism, gossip, complaining, and comparing. Those little ants, the automatic negative thoughts, can make a real mess in your life. I think it's time for some organic, non-toxic ant spray, huh? All right, the next big idea is seeing yourself as a child. Quote, if we were to take a three-year-old child and put him in the middle of the room, and you and I were to start yelling at the child, telling him how stupid he was, how he could never do anything right, 
how he should do this and shouldn't do that, and look at the mess he made, and maybe hit him a few times, we would end up with a frightened little child who sits docilely in the corner or who tears up the place. The child will go one of these two ways, but we will never know the potential of that child. If we take the same little child and tell him how much we love him, how much we care, that we love the way he looks and love how bright and clever he is, that we love the way he does things, and that it's okay for him to make mistakes as he learns, and that we will always be there for him no matter what, then the potential that comes out of that child will blow your mind. Each one of us has a three-year-old child within us, and we often spend most of our time yelling at that kid in ourselves. Then we wonder why our lives don't work. End quote. Wow, well that puts things in perspective, huh? How are you treating that three-year-old kid within you? Picture that dynamic the next time you start getting mean with yourself and check in to see if that's the way you treat an adorable little three-year-old with infinite potential. All right, how about a little bit more kid love with the next big idea, learning how to walk or talk. Quote, when a little child is learning to walk or talk, we encourage him and praise him for every tiny improvement he makes. The child beams and eagerly tries to do better. Is this the way you encourage yourself when you are learning something new? Or do you make it harder to learn because you tell yourself that you are stupid or clumsy or a failure? End quote. So this is one of the coolest ways to approach learning. A lot of different authors talk about it. Imagine yourself as a little child, first learning how to walk or talk. Squeeze your little cheeks, you little cutie. All right, so back to business. So you're this adorable little diaper-wearing angel, giddily pushing your edges and falling down and trying again and laughing while you, quote, fail as you learn to walk. Only you don't see it as failure. Because, among other things, A, you're having way too much fun doing something just a little better than you did a moment before, and B, that part of your brain that processes thoughts like that, the critical thoughts, hasn't even developed yet. So you're back to intuitively rocking it, and, of course, you learn remarkably quickly. All right, that's scenario number one. Scenario number two, you're still in your diapers, only this time, bring your current mind. Now learn how to walk or talk. Good luck with that. How about a quick look at your internal dialogue? Something like this. Oh my God, did anyone just see that? I just fell again. Gah, that's at least the fifth time this morning I fell. This just isn't happening. I feel like such an idiot. And that other kid over there is totally rocking it. And he's like a month younger than me. Forget it. This sucks. I'm just not cut out for this. But no need to be attached to results. Breathe. Oh, whatever. I give up. I need a nap. End quote. <laughs> All right. That's your little internal dialogue in diapers. <laughs> Too funny. Seriously, though, what if we embraced our spiritual evolution, our personal development in every skill we're developing, whether it's parenting or relationships or whatever, with the same innocent joy with which we approached learning to walk? And what if we treated our friends with the same bust out the video camera because Susie just almost crawled in her relationship celebrative support we offer kids when they're rocking a new skill? That is a great world. Let's create it. Starting with ourselves, of course. And that leads us to the next big idea, blaming and power. Quote, blame is one of the surest ways to stay in a problem. In blaming another, we give away our power. Understanding this enables us to rise above the issue and take control of our future. The past cannot be changed. The future is shaped by our current thinking. End quote. Blame. Such a fascinating thing. We've got to realize that, as Luis says, blame is one of the surest ways to stay in a problem. So why is blame so bad? Why is it such a great way to make sure we stay locked in a problem? Several reasons. Number one is the fact that we're putting control outside of ourselves and giving our power away. Not a good idea. I've mentioned the fact that psychologists call this your locus of control a number of times in these notes. You can have an internal locus of control or an external locus of control. External means you blame a bad childhood, economy, or hair day for your current well-being. 
ikipu is the technical description for that state. You do that and you'll be measurably less healthy, happy, all that you want to be. The alternative is simple. Bring your power back. Make your locus of control internal, inside you. Know that despite the childhood, the economy, or the hair day, you always have a choice on how you respond to life. So exercise that freedom. Stop blaming. Stop, stop, stop. Take your power back and know that you're consciously creating a fabulous future with each empowering thought. And that leads us to the next big idea, love your bills. Quote, it is essential that we stop worrying about money and stop resenting our bills. Many people treat bills as punishments to be avoided if possible. A bill is an acknowledgement of our ability to pay. The creditor assumes you are affluent enough and gives you the services or the product first. I bless with love each and every bill that comes into my home. I bless with love and stamp a small kiss on each and every check I write. If you pay with resentment, money has a hard time coming back to you. If you pay with love and joy, you open the free-flowing channel of abundance. Treat money as a friend, not as something you wad up and crush into your pocket. End quote. So how do you deal with bills? Getting a bill really is an amazing thing when you think about it. Someone gave you something because, in essence, they believed in and trusted you. Whether it's a plumber who helps you out then sends you a bill, or a credit card company that gives you cash then sends you a bill. If you have a knee-jerk reaction anytime you get a bill, see if you can take a moment and reflect on the incredible cooperation, love, and trust involved in every simple exchange. Then, rather than get all pissy about it, bless the bill. Thank the individual who gave you his or her services or the individuals who make up the company that created the products you enjoy. These people deserve our appreciation for spending some of their precious life force on helping us have a more enjoyable life. Yeah? That's the way we want to roll. And if you're currently in a really tight position cash-wise, it's even more important you get in the habit of reorienting your relationship to money. You might dig my notes on a couple of other books that were really transformative for me. Spiritual Economics, The Science of Getting Rich were two big ones for me. Plus, The Secrets of the Millionaire Mind is cool as well. We've also got Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and a couple other titles. So make money your friend and give the next bill you pay a little smooch, will ya? Thank you. All right, a couple more big ideas. The next one is, let's not shrivel our soul. Quote, Often, what we think of as the things wrong with us are only our expressions of our individuality. This is our uniqueness and what is special about us. Nature never repeats itself. Since time began on this planet, there have never been two snowflakes alike or two raindrops the same. And every daisy is different from every other daisy. Our fingerprints are different and we are different. We are meant to be different. When we can accept this, then there is no competition and no comparison. To try to be like another is to shrivel our soul. We have come to this planet to express who we are. End quote. All the great teachers go off on this theme. You can see the notes on, well, all of them for echoes. We've heard this at least a dozen, perhaps a million times, but do you get it? We're not here to be a second-rate version of someone else. It's time to really embrace our uniqueness, release all our restrictions, and fully give ourselves to the world. And that leads us to the final big idea. Put your awareness into practice. Quote, think thoughts that make you happy. Do things that make you feel good. Be with people who make you feel good. Eat things that make your body feel good. Go at a pace that makes you feel good. So remarkably simple and equally powerful. We've all read a lot, thought a lot, had a million aha moments, and guess what? It's time to live them. No stress, no strain, pure acceptance of who we are and where we're at. Pick the practices and the pace that makes you feel good, and let's rock. All right, well, that wraps up the note. I will share a bit about Louise Hay and uh, some of the quotes from the sidebar. We'll start with Louise. She is a metaphysical lecturer and teacher and best-selling author of numerous books, including Heal Your Body, A Through Z, and Empowering Women. Her works have been translated into 29 languages and 35 countries throughout the world. Since beginning her career as a science of mind minister in 1981, 
Luis has assisted millions of people in discovering and using the potential of their own creative powers for personal growth and self-healing. Luis is the owner and founder of Hay House Incorporated, a self-help publishing company that distributes books, audios, and videos that contribute to the healing of the planet. That is from the book. You can visit Luis online at luishay.com and hayhouse.com. How about some quotes from the side of the PDF? She says this, I cross bridges with joy and with ease. All of these quotes will be from Luis. She says, I expect my life to be good and joyous, and it is. Your security is not your job or your bank account or your investments or your spouse or parents. Your security is your ability to connect with the cosmic power that creates all things. Your mind is a tool you can choose to use any way you wish. The thoughts you choose to think create the experiences you have. Impatience is just another form of resistance. It is resistance to learning and to changing. When we demand that it be done right now, completed at once, then we don't give ourselves time to learn the lesson involved with the problem we have created. By far, the biggest category of resistance is fear, fear of the unknown. Almost all our programming, both negative and positive, was accepted by us by the time we were three years old. Be kind to yourself. Begin to love and approve of yourself. That's what the little child needs in order to express itself as its highest potential. I believe life is really very simple. What we give out, we get back. Loving ourselves begins with never, ever criticizing ourselves about anything. The only diet that does work is a mental diet, dieting from negative thoughts. I never believe it when clients try to convince me how terrible they are or how unlovable they are. My work is to bring them back to the time when they knew how to really love themselves. The most powerful way to do affirmations is to look in the mirror and say them out loud. If you don't have the thought, you won't have the feeling, and thoughts can be changed. Change the thought, and the feeling must go. The words we speak are indicative of our inner thoughts. Loving the self, to me, begins with never criticizing ourselves for anything. Criticism locks us into the very pattern we are trying to change. Understanding and being gentle with ourselves helps us to move out of it. Remember, you have been criticizing yourself for years, and it hasn't worked. Try approving of yourself and see what happens. Self-approval and self-acceptance in the now are the main keys to positive changes in every area of our lives. Those are the quotes. And if you enjoyed this note, I think you'll enjoy other books, many by Hay House, in fact, including Ask and It Is Given, The Power of Intention by Wayne Dyer. Ask and It Is Given is by Esther and Jerry Hicks. Trust Your Vibes, The Amazing Power of Deliberate Intent, The Astonishing Power of Emotions, and happy for no reason. So that is a quick look at a great book, You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. Hope you enjoyed. Trust you're doing great and look forward to sharing more with you soon. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this Philosopher's Note. Please go to www.philosophersnotes.com to download more.